Sunday dinner in the South was once a staple that would never have been missed, no matter what demands were on the family. These days, the schedules are tighter and the food requests are lighter. Today, we're taking a look at what makes this tradition important and sit down with Lauren McDuffie, a Charleston, South Carolina-based cookbook author, food writer, stylist, and photographer, for some ideas on how we can lighten up Sunday dinner in the South. I'm Lainey. And I'm Laura Beth. And we are Steel Magnolias. The strength of steel with the grace of a magnolia. We are here to have uplifting conversations about life in the South. And we've got plenty of room at our table. So pull up a chair. Well, we record on Sundays, which Mm -hmm. helped us very easily come up (laughs) with our topic for today, which is Sunday dinner in the South. That's right. So we wanted to talk about everything from where this really came from to typical recipes or items you would see at a gathering to kind of church or neighborhood potluck, which is sometimes also on a... Sunday. So, well, when I think of Sunday dinner in the South, I kind of have a visual even of just a porch filled with rocking chairs and people sitting in those rockers with dogs laying next to them on that porch and screen doors pulled open and slamming shut and sweet tea glasses sitting around and good smells coming from the kitchen. Kids kind of running all over the place and a couple of added card tables because there's not enough room at the dining room table with just, those are just kind g- of some of my visual gingham paper <laughs> yes. uh, tablecloths <laughs> over them so the kids table doesn't have a mess or a spill yeah. yeah well what you find on the history well I just you know I was just digging around a little bit but it you know Sunday supper is a, a midday or rather the main meal yeah on Sunday sometimes called Sunday dinner uh-huh. and you Typically, you know, back when, would not have said Sunday lunch. No. You would have said Sunday dinner. Yeah. Supper would be for evening, usually. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's more likely to occur a little later in the afternoon, mm-hmm. kind of in that noon to 4 p.m. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of that is because of church. That's right. People are occupied with attending church in the morning. And the practice of Sunday supper originated with families gathering after church for a full meal in England and Europe. And those are countries that are deep with Christian heritage. Yeah. And today, Sunday supper continues, um, you know, as a special time for families, but it's far less common. That's just because of our schedules and yeah. just demands and detachment from church going rituals That's, as well yeah. for sure um there's and even, even people don't live in the same city as their relatives That's whereas true. it was often kind of around a family that's true you invited others but. yeah but even sports commitments have yeah. started to encroach you know on eclipse on yeah church that's and true. therefore um the rest of the day just other sorts of participatory mm-hmm. events and kids lives and modern day pools for our <laughs> schedule yeah so i it is funny there's a there's a sunday supper movement website i know did you I found this too i didn't know about it until i was looking at this subject so but. they offer you know online food community with recipes events and you know just different ways so to funny isn't it in their way modernize sunday supper and create a little brand but it does encourage families there the website encourages families to cook and sit down to eat together. And we just commend them for that. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Well, I think on Sundays, while yes, schedules are busy, people typically are not in quite the hurry. Right. That they are any other days of the week. Again, in the South, still, you know, quite a few people have been to church. And that's kind of what this is also based on. You invite maybe the pastor or priest or yeah visiting speaker or whatever to come over and um so just the timing and then you've been with people you're in a good mood hopefully from that time for the day and you're already dressed it's an easy transition to and you're hungry by that point so that's right all of that kind of played in um i think now our culture just has this hurry up and eat syndrome yes that is um 
kind of frustrating to me. I, I get in that mode too sometimes. Right. But you and I have both had the privilege to travel a little bit. And I think this is still mostly an American problem. The hurry the up hurry and up eat. And eat yes, thing. Absolutely. Um, in European countries, especially Italy, France, places like that, like the meal time is the entertainment. Yeah. I mean, that's not exactly what you do before the entertainment. It is the entertainment. Yes. So waiters and waitresses in those places find that strange that you're, you know, we need to hurry because we have tickets to this thing. Right. And they're like, oh, like that's kind of a yeah. shocking that yeah. you're hurrying this meal. But it would even be... I would think, from a server standpoint, kind of frowned upon if you're just basically holding the table. Like, if you're just lingering. Here, here, yeah. here yeah. they're like, we got to turn this table. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, from both sides, yeah. uh, culture-wise. It is funny. It's... But I think that um, Sundays, there's still maybe a little bit more of the slow down and enjoy yeah. conversation. I think so, Yeah. Yeah. Than, than you see other days of the week. Exactly. At least. Yeah. It's, so. it's, we'll, we'll still count it as the slowest yeah. of there the you go. seven days. <laughs> there you go. It may not be slow, but it's the slowest. And I, I even think, um, you know, the tradition of this, even, you know, in our growing up, I'm not talking about a super long time ago, people didn't go out to eat very right. often. That was very yeah. rare. Yeah. And so it was pretty much a given you were going to go home go to home have to a meal. Yeah. People didn't have the money to go out to exactly. eat all the time, especially for a whole family. Exactly. So um, there and there weren't even a lot of choices of restaurants True. like there are now. True. You know, there's yeah so many. But anyway, I thought I was thinking about that. That that's probably another reason that yeah. that was so big. Yeah. So what are the foods that you think of most right off the top of your head when you're thinking Sunday supper? Okay. When I think Sunday supper, I think fried chicken. Okay. I think roast with Pot potatoes roast. and that carrots. Was, that was number one it. on my list. Okay. Um, chicken and dumplings was kind of okay. a popular thing, um, which I personally is not a favorite of mine. I don't like the chicken, and, chicken dumplings. and dumplings thing. That, that's kind of even a roast chicken or a ham, something yeah. on a platter. For some reason, I picture a meat on a platter. Yeah. Kind of a... Warm foods, though. Warm foods. I mean, primarily yeah. a meat. Even a chicken pot pie. Oh, yeah. You know, very comfort say, food. Yeah. But that could have, you know, been made ahead of time and then bake right when you get home. Uh, I would say potatoes is definitely just some, some somehow sort of potato. That's going to be in the is, mix. It's got to be. I think included. one beautiful thing about the South is, um, and we have some beautiful things in the summer, corn, tomatoes, mm -hmm. you know, okra, just all these wonderfully fresh things. And then in the, you, what you would have seen it, uh, a long time ago, not so much now, is they would then can that stuff. Right. And you'd have the same things, just canned yeah. versions later. All year long. That's right. Yes. And including jams with your biscuits and um, some of that kind of thing. So. Yeah. I also commend some of these just true Southern women. <laughs> and it could have been men too. I don't mean to. But <laughs> usually, let's face it, it was the women. Um, who were making sa on Saturday the pies, the cakes. Absolutely. You know, getting some of the stuff ready so that the timing, it made it look easy. It sure did. Oh, we just warmed yeah. this up and whipped this up. But they'd been working on it all uh -huh. weekend, you uh -huh. know, getting the stages of that yeah. together. And so I just think about how much we need to commend some of these yes. women that make this all look easy. All the pie easy. makers. <laughs> it's not. I would say meatloaf would be another oh, one absolutely. I would add to the absolutely. mix. Absolutely, I um, also think one important thing about a Sunday dinner or supper that I think about is just the saying of grace, too. Mm -hmm. Like, often you would see, if you had invited your pastor or somebody like that, maybe they would do it. Mm -hmm. But um, often it was the head of the house, the sure. man of the house yeah. would do it or something like that. And I yeah. just think that's even a sweet piece of... Um, of a Sunday mm -hmm. dinner and even just also wanted to mention that multi-generational yes of that meal and I always love that social I, and table skills right yes it encourages that and gives it a place and to practice great place to practice great 
way to hear stories of yeah. the other generations yeah. for both sides, you know, yeah. both sides. And um, yeah, so I love anything that gets people telling stories and history and yeah. learning personalities and yeah. all of that that come with multi-generational But I do think gatherings. that we have to give a place for practice, for That's table right. skills. Safety. Of- even if you're accustomed to sitting down as a family on a reg- you know on a very pretty regular basis mm-hmm. there's still that comfort that starts to happen if you're just speaking to your mom or your dad or both or a sibling yeah. or yeah. you know and there does we've mentioned this before but there needs to even be promptings by the older parents or or something to say hey carol ask her ask her about that yes play she was in yeah you were mentioning you thought that was neat whatever yeah. like kind of giving them promptings of what the, how to even do that yeah so as much as I think we we sort of believe that even the teens or you know tweens are rolling their eyes at this sort of thing the the number one sort of experience I go back to and I've shared this with you many times before was when I was a leader in young life which is Yes. An organization that is worldwide and reaches out to primarily high school students. Mm -hmm. And they have a fantastic camp program. Oh, my goodness. Which is (laughs) far above a lot of other summer camp type places that you'd probably imagine. We're talking, you know, 1,500 foot mountain hikes in Colorado and zip lining and horseback horseback riding riding and just, you know, just extremities. All kinds of beautiful, beautiful properties all over the country and actually worldwide. But at the end of each week, which they always claim will be the best week of your life or your money back. That's amazing. Yeah. Guarantee. (laughs) All of the youths, or not all, but a lot of the youth students, the majority, said their favorite thing about camp was the dining hall, meaning the time where we sat down in circular tables. Okay. And they were served a meal, and we just had conversation. And I just think... Even if we think those teens are rolling their eyes mm-hmm. at the fact that they have to sit down or they have to stay at the table until everyone's phone with them, hopefully. done, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. They secretly need it and love it. That's so, right. Some, I agree. If Sunday supper's the only time during a week when your family can do this because of schedules, then that could be, you know, an integral part of the kind of development mm-hmm. of your kids. So, I love that. Um. I came across a book um, that was interesting. I just looked at it online like I didn't actually hold the book. Okay. That was called Sunday Dinner in the South. Hey. The author's name is Tammy Allgood. And it had some, it was just a lovely book. Okay. Had some stories from different um, pastors of different churches in the South. Oh, fun. Different things like that. But also just, you know, lovely layout of recipes. Okay. And different things like that. So that might be something if you want to... Um, Look at a particular book. There's tons of different ones out there, but I thought that one was really pretty. So speaking of books, we got the chance to sit down and talk to author Lauren McDuffie. Now, Lauren is a South Carolina-based cookbook author, food writer, stylist, and creator of the popular website, My Kitchen Little. She had a cookbook that came back a while back that was an Appalachian-ish cookbook called Smoke Roots Mountain Harvest. And she's got a new cookbook coming out called Southern Lights, which actually releases in June on Lainey's birthday. So anyway, we thought it would be good to, you know, talk about how can we make it lighter? How can we make Sunday dinner lighter? We released an episode in our first season, I believe, that was Sunday dinner in the South, where we talked about and shared recipes on some of these staples we've discussed. But how can we do this a little different and Lauren was actually a perfect person to talk to because she did not, you know, she doesn't want us to sacrifice some of the things that are important, like taste. She's just found great ways to make some substitutions. So without further ado, here's our conversation with Lauren, and we think you'll really enjoy her take on Sunday dinner in the South. Well, welcome Lauren to the Steel Magnolias podcast. Thank you so much for having me. 
I'm so excited to have you. I'm, I told you just before we started recording that I'm very jealous of your <laughs> <laughs> local neighborhood that you get to call home because you're on James yeah. Island in Charleston, yeah. South Carolina and near my fa- one of my favorite beaches, Folly Beach. And I, did you say yeah. you had just been there today? Yes, just this morning I took my dog. Um, we're trying to take advantage of the spring here is my favorite time of year um, because it's it's still kind of cold other places, so it feels kind of special. <laughs> like yeah. we can be out and about, and uh, but it's getting ready to get pretty hot here. So I try to take advantage of being outside as much as I can yeah. while everything's in bloom and it smells like perfume everywhere you go. It's just pretty great. So it's my favorite. You're right. And especially if you get to get up close to some of those infamous window boxes in yes. downtown, those Ugh. do they, the, the fragrance yeah. is right at nose level. So it just, it's it the does. Best. Yeah. We just <laughs> little stroll downtown. I do that with my kids after school, especially when the Jasmine blooms, which is usually in April. It's just incredible. So it's definitely the best time. Fun. Yeah. In my opinion. Well, we thought that you would be a good person to talk to today as we are taking a look at Sunday dinner in the South, yeah. Sunday supper, Sunday dinner. We uh-huh. won't get into all the semantics of who calls <laughs> potato, it what. Potato. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. You hear both. It's very interchangeable mm-hmm. and it's very confusing because oftentimes it's talking about lunch and it's saying yes, dinner, but that's right. It can um, be <laughs> the, the Sunday meal. And yes. um, it's, it's an important part of our history of, you know, when more of a, um, a, a more relaxed Sunday schedule was a part of people's lives. It's, yeah. I, you know, we all know yeah. that sports and other commitments and um, yeah. even family being in different places, uh, the, the, oh, yeah. sun, the sacredness of Sunday um, and the schedule of it, it has changed and morphed over time. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the most part, a yeah. lot of people, if they have a slow day, it's Sunday. Um, yep. it, it, it could be categorized as like the slowest <laughs> of days. It yeah, I think slow. that's true. But slower. Uh, You're right. <laughs> yeah, slower. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so that being said, it can mm-hmm. oftentimes be the best time to have people over to yeah. actually have that coveted sit down sort of meal with your family or a neighbor yeah. or um, someone you've, you know, recently welcomed to the neighborhood or, mm-hmm. you know, whoever, um, put, putting the leaf in the table kind of meal, right? Yeah, like just, exactly. You know, adding, I like that. Pulling up yeah. a few extra chairs. Um, mm-hmm. And so sometimes those meals can be on the heavier side. We've discussed <laughs> even on this episode, you know, fried chicken and mm-hmm. mashed potatoes mm-hmm. and, you know, the starches can be heavy. The the yeah. meats can even be heavy. Yes. So you have really dived deep into some Southern recipes that are mm-hmm. really on more of the lighter side. Um, yeah. And so you've got a new cookbook out, which we'll, mm-hmm. we'll talk about in just a minute, but yeah. From your point of view, like what would be some ideas of things that you could serve on a Sunday meal that would be lighter per se? A little bit lighter. Yeah. So I, I love just the notion of a Sunday dinner or Sunday supper. I think it so perfectly captures what I love most about cooking, which is it makes us hit pause and it's this catalyst for conversation and just still be still for a second, put the screens down, just hit pause. And I, I love that whole notion. I think that's why I've loved cooking for such a long time and why I find ways to do it, um, all of the time. But, um, yeah, I, I grew up with Sunday dinners with my family. And just like you just said, it was always fried chicken after church. That's what we did every Sunday at my grandparents' house. It was just this um, this ritual. And I loved it. It's a delicious thing. But um, yeah, there are ways to make it a little bit lighter. And there was always mashed potatoes. Like you just hit the two things that come <laughs> to my mind when I when I think of Sunday dinners or Sunday suppers. Um, and in... So in my in my book that we'll I guess talk a bit more about here in a second, um, I I have a couple of recipes that immediately come to mind that kind of underscore I think ways that are really easy and do for us cooks to just lighten up some of the heavier hitters like a fried chicken, um, and it's just for me it's about finding simple even just one ingredient that you can swap out for something a little bit lighter 
maybe something a little bit more nutritious. If you can find ways to do that with all of the foods you cook, then you're kind of doing yourself a favor. And I think it's sustainable. For me, it's not about finding a way to take out every calorie and every fat gram, because I think that's kind of sad. And it's like not very, uh, doesn't sound delicious to me. And I think you can do that, but then no one's going to eat it if it doesn't taste good. So, so for me, I'm always trying to find ways to just subtly lighten things because I think that's realistic and it's approachable. So when I think of fried chicken, I've, I've got a recipe that I love that's, um, it's chicken thighs and, but they're boneless. So it's a quicker cooking, kind of a less cleanup. We're not going to deep fat fry anything. This is like a skillet dinner that you finish in the oven. And I think for me to mimic that salty, kind of fatty, crunchy chicken skin that everybody loves and fried chicken, I, I call this Frico chicken. And I take Parmesan cheese and I melt them into basically crisps in the oven, just Parmesan crisps. And those melt right on top of the chicken. And it kind of mimics that uh, that crispy chicken skin, but it's a lot faster. It's a lot cleaner and you don't have to deal with a big vat of oil. And yeah. and so that is one of my favorite tricks. I do it, I've been doing it a lot lately and that, that recipe's in my, in my book and I just love it. That so, is awesome. So that would be yeah. baked. Is that what you're saying? You would it just is, bake that? It is baked. Yeah, wow. it's baked. Okay. And so it's lighter in every sense. It's, it's less, takes less time, less cleanup, less pots and yeah. pans. And, um, but you still kind of get that flavor and texture payoff. Um, mm-hmm. It's very cozy and it's very satisfying. feels a little more naughty than it actually is. Um, <laughs> and then um, I've got a mashed potato recipe that I love, that I reach for a lot. Because that is one of, I love mashed potatoes. My brother, it's, I think, his favorite food. I make them every year on his birthday, which is in July. It's actually on July 4th, so that's a bizarre thing to make in July. But it's a big thing in my family. We love mashed potatoes. My mom makes killer mashed potatoes, but they are the richest things. You know, they're they're not light at all. And so I've explored some ways to kind of cut back a little bit. Um, And so I've got a recipe in in my book that's, um, it has no butter, no sour cream, no cream cheese, um, which almost sounds like how could this possibly be (laughs) worth our time at all. But I create this um, roasted garlic cream that is roasted garlic that you blend with, as bizarre as it sounds, uh, whipped cottage cheese, which is actually an ingredient that I use all the time. I just don't tell people because I think some people don't love that. But when you combine it with um, roasted garlic and some herbs, salt, pepper, and even a little bit of olive oil, it creates this healthier kind of creamy thing that you can add to so many different dishes. And I put it in mashed potatoes and I whip it all up and it's so, so good. And it kind of mimics sour cream. Yeah, mashed potato. And those are things that are just better for you. They sort of serve you better. Um, Not quite as rich, but still really, really delicious. That is amazing. What is your yeah. go-to? What's your go-to um, cottage cheese? Do you have a brand or a? Um... Oh, I do. It's called Good. I think it's just Good or Good Culture. And this is a recent find, so I might have to. I can uh, circle back with you on that. But but to be honest, I'm not that picky. Okay. To, um, there are a lot. I think it must have become trendy because I've noticed there are several really kind of higher end cottage cheeses <laughs> yeah. out there now um, that were not available when I was a kid. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's worth spending another dollar or two on the, okay. the slightly nicer ones. Cause the flavor payoff is huge and they're just yeah. really good, really good quality. And I have found ways to, to use, yeah, cottage cheese just by whipping it up. Nobody knows what it is anymore. It just, yeah. <laughs> it tastes so good. Um, when you put it in other things. So yeah, that sounds very, that sounds very sneaky, but I sneaky love it. <laughs> yeah. It, it yeah, sounds so like it'll have the cream base that yeah. we, we Southerners need in our, our casseroles yeah. or in our, um, yeah, you need it. our size. It's, absolutely. It can do that. <laughs> now in the, in the context of like vegetables or greens, mm-hmm. Southerners are notorious for, you know, taking a hearty, yeah. good vegetable for you, but then cooking it in like a bacon fat or, yes. um, you yeah. know, just really mm-hmm. um, sort of stripping away some of yeah. the nutrients that, that mm-hmm. really make it sound like you're eating something healthy, but now you've That's, fattened it up. Yeah. Um, cook, so cook do you have, death. yeah. Do yeah. you have anything that you like to do um, to keep greens truly greens, I guess? Yeah. I and mean, I was trying to solve that exact issue. Um, I love a pot of cooked all day collard greens. It's one of, to me, that's a comfort food I love it so much, but 
yeah, to your point, we've kind of cooked out a lot of the goodness maybe. Um, Mm -hmm. And so to kind of make up for that a little bit, I've got a recipe or a way that I like to cook greens. Um, I try to choose super healthy, dark greens. There there are a lot of nutrients. They're very nutrient dense. Um, And instead of cooking them all day in like a a very fatty base, um, I just kind of roast them. I'll do, or I'll take a green and I'll use it in two different ways. I'll just do a quick saute in olive oil. And I have a, like a barbecue spice rub that I, that I created for my cookbook and I'll rub the greens in that. It's, it's kind of a play on words. I don't really rub the greens, but I cook the greens with this spice blend, give it kind of a nod barbecue and roast the other half of the greens in the oven, creating almost like chips, like kale chips work really well for that. And I serve the crispy greens on top of just the quick sauteed greens. And it's just this very interesting kind of play on two different textures. And it's still so flavorful. A little bit of lemon can go a long way with greens. A lot Mm -hmm. of time collard greens are finished with vinegar. That's a very classic way to do it. So I always try to make sure I'm thinking about the flavors and how to honor the original mm-hmm. while still lightening it up a little bit. So I found that you can just do a quick saute of greens with a little bit of garlic, onion, and olive oil. And then that spice rub that I love so much. And it's delicious. You don't have to necessarily cook them all day in yeah. bacon fat or yeah. like ham hock. <laughs> you don't have to do that. It's still, greens are pretty, pretty great on their own with very little done to them. So yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's yeah. really good. And and sounds even more simple. So who it's doesn't so want simple? simple? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. absolutely true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And then what about, you know, dessert? Sometimes we're so stuffed we're not ready for or leave room for dessert. But yeah. if the host or the, the the chef or the cook has made a dessert, you always feel like you kind of have to partake. So yeah. Is there something on the lighter side that you would recommend? So yeah, so one thing I've started to do, I love pies. That's always been my go-to kind of, and especially when I think of family gatherings or Sunday dinners, I think of cozy desserts like that. I don't think of the fussy sort of highfalutin things. I don't want to individually plate a bunch of things for people. I want to put a pie out on the counter and let everybody mm-hmm. just go to town on something just very simple and homey. And that's always what I what I make. And um, for this book, when I was kind of exploring ways to lighten up desserts like that, that can be kind of heavy. I mean, pie crusts are mostly butter and, you know, there's a lot going on there. So I have simply just, it's the easiest, simplest change, but I just make, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of pandowdies. It's very much in the same school as a pie and a cobbler or a crisp. It kind of lives in that same space. But it's basically a pie that doesn't have any crust on the bottom. And the crust just stays on the top. And you break it up and make it look all messy. And it gets all crunchy on the top. That's where the dowdy comes in. It's kind of ugly. But I love that because it makes it really easy for you as a baker. It's not supposed to look pretty. (laughs) So so it's especially good. It takes the pressure off of you. But you've eliminated half of the crust by doing that. And nobody misses it. That's what I've learned is... Mm -hmm you can take an entire half of the pie crust out of the equation and you've just made the thing a lot lighter and you've not even Mm -hmm. really impacted the flavor whatsoever. So it's very simple, almost too simple seeming changes like that though, that I've tried to weave into this, this book and just my own home cooking. And it just adds up over time, I think is really what it's all about. So it can be as easy as that. Yeah, that's good. I agree. So many times, whether you half the sugar uh, yeah. content or just switch out, you know, something sugar for mm-hmm. switch it out for honey. A lot yeah. of times people do not miss that. Nope. Yeah. You just yeah. don't. You're so right. And that's definitely something that I've learned uh, more and more lately as I've been trying to do it more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. just don't know what's gone. You just don't tell yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Don't make a big deal out of it. Right. Just lips mm-hmm. sealed. Yeah. Yes. Well, Lauren, your new trick. cookbook is called Southern Lights easier, lighter, and better for you recipes from the South. It's available now for pre-order and it's Mm going to be coming out this June. So tell us sort of how did this cookbook come to be and what can people expect in it? So this book really is a way for me to just to show off food that I love and that I grew up with. I mean, I've grown up with Um, in the South and different regions of the South, actually, my whole life. And um, the the people in my family who were my biggest culinary influences were Southern cooks. And so it's just near and dear to my heart, really. Um, I live in Charleston now, so it's just this amazing source of inspiration um, for someone who likes to cook and who likes food like I do. And so I really wanted to make a book that kind of showcased Southern food, but uh, maybe the lighter side of the Southern table. 
as we've been, we've been talking about, I've learned that there are ways to enjoy more of the Southern food we like by simply just making some reasonable swaps. Um, some of these heavy hitting uh, mm-hmm. classic Southern recipes can still be delicious by making just little changes. And so that's what this book explores, just different ways of doing that. Um, but still maintaining the heart of what makes them great. But another thing I really wanted to kind of honor with this book was the fact that so much of Southern cooking is already healthy and light to begin with. It's just, you just don't hear a lot about that. Um, That's not what gets all of the glory. I think when I told people I was making a lighter Southern cookbook, so so many people looked at me like, what are you talking, what are you talking about? That's (laughs) not a thing. And it it is. In fact, I've heard cooking compared, like classic Southern cooking compared to Mediterranean cooking, which is sort of funny at first, but um, but it's true because nobody knows how to wield fresh produce, I think, better than a Southern cook. That's really, mm-hmm. to me, what it's all about. Simple ways to prepare all of the goodness that is grown in Southern ground. That's really what it's about. Um, it doesn't have to be deep fried stuff. It doesn't have to be butter laden, this and that. So um, that is something I know to be true. And I wanted to show that off a little bit with the book. So. That's so good. Yeah. What would you say? I know it, this is probably like asking um, which of your children is your favorite, but do you have a, <laughs> do you have a favorite recipe that you've included in this one? Okay. So I do. Um, this recipe, it's, it's really, it's really simple. It's just like six ingredients and it is basically a candied pecan, but I, I call them red velvet pecans. They're, they're bright red and it's a little bit of a nod to the red velvet cake. There's a little bit of cocoa powder in them, but there's no butter and there's no sugar. Um, and they are so good. And, um, so it's just was like a victory recipe for me. And I participated in the Charleston wine and food festival last weekend. And I took these, I made a thousand portion of these of these nuts. And I took them and I gave, I gave them out to all these people all day long. And I, my husband was with me. He was helping me and we were just blown away at how successful they were. People loved them. People kept coming back and saying they wanted more and they wanted to buy them and that it was their favorite bite of the day, (laughs) just these little pecans. Um, so, uh, I just am excited about that recipe even more than I was before. So I think it's my favorite. That sounds yeah. so good. That sounds so good. Oh, I need to try those for sure. They're fun. Yeah, they're good in a salad. They're good at Christmas time. The yes. holidays with all the red. Yeah, so it's just a fun one. Yeah. I love it. Well, if you guys want to connect with Lauren now, you can, like we said, pre-order her book, but she can also, uh, you can also connect with her through her popular recipe website, which is called My Kitchen Little. And it's very organized. I love that there's options to view recipes by meal type. So, you know, if you're looking for a bread, go to the breads or snacks or soups or salads. But also the photography was just really, really beautiful. And I feel like, you you know, good job. That was that's that's oftentimes for someone that's um, a little hesitant or reluctant to try a recipe. Um, beautiful photography can make thank it you. that incentive that you know oh I could do that so that's so nice um, thank you yeah yeah so I appreciate the time talking to you we all Likewise. look forward to, to catching up with the lighter version of what we can do um, in our Sunday <laughs> meals and thank you just for inspiring us to oh, give, give some swaps welcome. a try that it, it won't yeah. really be that much sacrifice so nope not yes. at all. You won't even notice. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, we will uh, be linking to all of this in our show notes so you guys can easily find and connect with Lauren. But thank you again. Take Thanks care. So much for having me. Thanks. Okay, y'all. So get your very important Sunday dinners on the family calendar. And now with Lauren's help on recipes, you can even be swimsuit season ready. See you next time.